it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce for our grand rounds uh, this evening or this morning, as the case may be, depending, uh, uh, Dr. Connaughton. Uh, Dr. Connaughton lives in Western Australia, uh, and he's been a consultant with uh, Rio Tinto Iron Ore as an occupational physician for 15 years. Uh, he's also served as president of the Australasian Faculty of Occupational Environmental Medicine for a few years in the 20 teens. Um, and he's an honorary secretary of the International Occupational Medicine Society Collaborative, now with over 50 uh, countries in membership. Uh, he was initially trained at the Institute of Occupational Medicine in Edinburgh and has an MBA uh, from, I believe it's the University of Western Australia, if I got the acronym correct. And he has a special interests that include assessing the value of occupational health interventions, which is a major subject of this uh, presentation. So I, I would, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational Environment Health, I uh, welcome Dr. Connaughton. And, and uh, by all means, uh, folks, keep your uh, questions. Uh, I don't know if we, uh, Bubba, do you want to have people put them in chat or how would you like that to go? I think people, people can put them in chat if they'd like. I also think that um, uh, if there's time, uh, uh, Peter, after your discussion, for people to chime in just via Zoom and, and communicate their questions to you that way, that would be fine as well. I think that's worked pretty well in the past as well. Yeah, great. Right. All right. Yeah, I'm happy to. Look, thank you very much for the introduction, Kurt. Uh, it's uh, a, a really great pleasure for me to be able to uh, participate today and to present. Um, one of my big interests is collaboration internationally, and I'm I'm honoured and delighted to be able to share some information with you today, so thank you. Um, my home is in Perth, Western Australia, on the west coast of Australia, and uh, we have a 15-hour time difference to Salt Lake City, where, so for me, it's 8.30 in the morning on Wednesday, and uh, the photo on the top left is my hometown, Perth, which is on the Swan River, and we're uh, on the West Coast, as I said, that's the Indian Ocean there in the lower photo. And um, so I'm delighted that we can, we can span the globe with uh, Zoom. And uh, I, just a few words about myself, I wear a number of different hats. I am the occupational physician for Rio Tinto Iron Ore, as Kurt mentioned, uh, and uh, also have uh, a long association with the Australasian Faculty of Occupational Environmental Medicine, uh, the photo at the top was taken just a couple of months ago in the far north of Western Australia uh, at one of the local rodeos. And you can see the, the red dirt in the background, which uh, it's red because it contains a lot of iron ore. Uh, and I'm particularly, sorry, ooh, I just want to go back for a minute. Excuse me. It's a little jumpy. Uh, I, as Kurt mentioned, I'm uh, involved with the International OCMED Society Collaborative. And uh, I think uh, that there's, there's great potential benefit from us sharing questions and challenges and knowledge uh, internationally. And um, so that's why I'm so pleased to be participating today. And I'm aware of the... Um, major operations at the Kennecott mine, the Kennecott copper mine. And in fact, we were delighted to have uh, one of the leaders of the emergency services from Kennecott visit us just a month or so ago. Uh, and I, I hope to um, visit myself one day. Uh, so just a little brief comment about what we do in Rio Tinto Iron Ore. You can see in the right lower corner there, there's a map of Australia overlaid with the United States. And you can see there are a similar proportions. So from my hometown in Perth on the West Coast to go to Sydney uh, is similar, fairly similar to going from LA to New York. And the mining operations, if you look in the uh, uh, image at the top uh, in the far Northwest of Western Australia, and it's a remote area that's at least two, two and a half hours flight from Perth and the iron ore operation, there are about 15,000 employees and about 10,000 contractors across 16 different mines. And so uh, significant challenges in terms of the remoteness 
and also the environment. The Pilbara, that northwest of Western Australia, is very hot. There's temperatures this week of 100 to 110 degrees. So there's some really interesting challenges in terms of the environment, the location, um, access, availability to medical services. Um, and most of the workers are fly in, fly out. So they live in Perth and fly up to the site. I work there for uh, usually eight days on and six days off. So I really feel privileged to be able to be involved in that challenging component of occupational medicine. Uh, and these are some images. So there's big port operations, uh, big rail network. Uh, I put the photo in the top left there. You'll notice if you look at that photo of the haul trucks, the Komatsu haul trucks, you'll notice the tracks that are on the ground there um, where they're running over the um, unsealed surface. There's something a little bit unusual about those that photo is that the track, the, the trucks are running almost exactly on the same path. Um, and that's because they're driverless trucks. They're um, what we call autonomous haulage system. And so the advancement of technology in the mining industry there is uh, here is uh, a really interesting uh, component of what we manage and deal with. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today, or primarily today, about the value of occupational health. And I think it's important for us in occupational medicine to be able to articulate uh, or for having others to articulate the value. It's hard to give a presentation these days without talking about COVID. And we had a, a, a very, an enormous project for those minds to prevent and manage the risk of COVID-19. Uh, as you can imagine, with 25,000 people in remote areas, um, the photo on the top left was the screening facility at the airport, um, screening and educating workers before they went to the remote locations. And in fact, because of the, uh, the isolation strategies, both in Australia and for remote work, and one of the biggest concerns was the risk of introducing COVID to remote Indigenous communities. That was one of our biggest concerns. And in fact, we didn't have a case on any of the mines until February 2022, which was quite extraordinary. And since that time, we've managed over 7,000 cases on the remote sites, uh, fortunately with no fatalities and only about 12 cases referred to hospital. Uh, and and being able to articulate value, this is our local newspaper, because those iron ore mines kept operating throughout COVID, the value to the community and in fact to Australia was enormous. The income from iron ore in Western Australia and Australia is uh, enormous, um, $15 billion just in company tax. Uh, and so that, that's um, I'm leading into the discussion about can we articulate our impact and can we articulate our value? Now, clearly not all of that value is from occupational physicians or occupational medicine, but uh, it, it, we played a role. And uh, the other value, one of the um, great, uh, I think, outcomes from, from the pandemic was the uh, ability or capability to collaborate. And there was a lot of collaboration, both medically and also with the state government. And uh, the person in the middle of that photograph is was the Minister for Health at the time, um, and Roger Cook, and he's now the Premier of the state, which would be the equivalent of your governor, I suppose. And the person on the left is Simon Trott, who was the, is the CEO of Rio Tinto Iron Ore. So for my presentation today, the objectives are to discuss the value to workers, uh, workplaces and organisations of occupational health. Uh, I think it's important that we practice discussing value uh, and not just in a dollar sense, it's the value, what is the value of workplace health to workers? Uh, and that, that's the top priority and the others follow. I'd like to give you a case study about um, 
the use of some very interesting software and data analytics in terms of disseminating occupational health data both to workers and to employers. And then to discuss perhaps some options for increasing our value and our scope through technology. So it's worth us looking back and thinking about Ramazzini. And uh, Ramazzini obviously was uh, extraordinary in terms of his, uh, the, the value that he created in terms of an epidemiological approach of looking at workplaces and workers and thinking about and articulating the risks to different workers in different workplaces. And one of the challenges, I don't know if it's the same for you in the States, but one of the challenges we have in our training programs and with our occupational physicians is, is getting them to regularly visit workplaces. And for me, that's one of the, uh, the joys, I think, of being an occupational physician, both seeing and being seen. And uh, I think it's important for us to remember um, why Ramazzini was so influential, because he went to workplaces and listened to workers and looked at their work environments. And then the second uh, part of that is communication. This book is still communicating to us a couple of hundred years later information about workplace risks. And uh, so I think it's important to us for us to take those lessons from the past and make sure that we're still applying them now. And on the other hand, it's interesting to think about what areas did Ramazzini struggle with? Um, and it's interesting in the diseases of workers that there was no reference to the interests of employers. And uh, in the current age, I don't think we can, we just can't continue to not be engaged with what is, or we're taking into account what are the interests of employers because communicating at the employer level and the leadership level is central, in my view, to changing workplace circumstances and to having, being able to leverage our knowledge and our information to change workplaces and to change work practices. And interestingly, that's something that Ramazzini uh, didn't discuss or cover. And he also spoke about the, the challenges of changing worker behaviour and taking the simplest of precautions. And I'm hoping that the data I showed to you today uh, will give um, uh, perhaps a window or an opportunity to how we can think about what are the best ways of influencing, what are some of the effective ways of influencing worker behaviours. So let's think about the scale of the challenge. Certainly in Australia, um, the estimated annual spend on work-related injury and illness is over $60 billion. Uh, now, our population is only uh, just over 25 million, which is tiny compared to the US. But the other reason for showing this slide is on the left side uh, is work-related injuries, about 28 billion, and on the right side, non-work-related injuries, so work-related illness. Uh, and certainly in Australia, the focus is very much on injuries and the focus and discussion about non-work-related illness uh, fades into um, a, a tiny component of the discussion and uh, a disappointingly small part of prevention um, because of uh, the, the structures in terms of investigating and rightfully investigating and reviewing and thinking about prevention of workplace injuries, um, the question would be, are we overlooking the impact of work-related illness? And uh, I, I think that's um, it's a credit to our colleagues in, in the safety area, how, um, how much drive and impetus and effectiveness they've had and I think the question for occupational physicians and occupational medicine, certainly in Australia, is are we thinking or are we focusing enough on work-related illness? So the case study I'm going to present 
uh, for you today is data from over 2,000 workers across a variety of different industries, which included mining and mining services over a range of three years. But it was not only mining, it also uh, got data from an, a large accounting firm and a number of other businesses. Now, the data on the workers was assessed using validated screening tools, and then the interventions were both online health education and personal professional support. And the outcomes I'm going to give you are from observational studies from individual industries, and we'll come back to that a little bit more later on. So this data is from a colleague of mine who uh, operates Optimum Health and Management Services in Western Australia. And the assessment modules are detailed there. Um, just a, a side note, often with new industries or new clients, we find that they tend to come to occupational physicians with one major problem. And is it that uh, a worker has had a heart attack at work or is it a significant mental health issue that they've identified or is it perhaps a fatigue issue or is it a bullying or harassment issue? The approach that Optimum Health takes is to, when a new client approaches them, is to say, well, look, we want to look at a minimum of three issues in your workplace. We'll certainly look at your primary issue but let's benchmark by looking at a couple of other areas. So, for example, in the top left, if they've had a number of cardiac arrests in the workplace, uh, that would be the focus. But we'd also look at gather, gathering some data perhaps on fatigue or gathering some data on workplace stress or the culture. Um, now, there's sometimes some reluctance to that, but that early gathering of data uh, is essential but it's also a process of modifying and being flexible with the initial assessment approach. Most organisations don't want nine things assessed uh, out of the immediately at the start. But as they see the value of gathering data, then often what happens over a period of time, they then become curious and want other things assessed. And whether that's workplace respect or more of an ergonomic approach, Often that evolves over time. So the interventions then, uh, a lot of the program is cloud-based. It's a cloud-based platform where individual workers have unlimited access to their own data and unlimited ex access to educational material, training videos and courses. And then for the people who identify at higher risks in different categories, uh, there is individualised approach which can be from professional services, uh, and whether that's a psychologist or whether that's a physiotherapist or whether that's a other healthcare provider. And you'll see in the lower three boxes there, the one of the important components really is the data analysis and the advice to the leaders and the employer. So the, the data is presented... Uh, at different, there's different levels of data uh, access. And as I said, the access to the worker is unlimited. The access of group data to the employer or to the leader is de-identified and uh, they get population data. So, you know, how many of their workforce are at high risk of a cardiac event or how many of the workforce, and you'll, I'll show you some of those these graphs. So the beauty of, um, just to repeat, the data, the information is using validated screening tools, and then the power of accessing the data is through the data analytics, and I'll show you some examples of that. So this, is, uh, this slide shows the Employee Health Hub uh, and the way that the data is presented is really important in terms of getting the message through to the workforce and to the leaders in a format that is readily understandable. And so the yellow and green and red flag system is something that has been really well accepted by the workforce. They can understand that it's non 
you know, it's non-medical jargon and uh, it's something that uh, we've been really pleased that people, it, it builds their interest and their engagement in the program. And also uh, workers track their progress over time. And what's happened is and some, for example, one of the organisations has branches in different states in Western Australia and it's that the requirements and the risks have for some organisations are very different from state to state. Same organisation, same operation, uh, but it's interesting to look at different trends and then you can focus or, uh, or change the focus depending on the risk and the requirements and transferring that data into actionable insights. Uh, so uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So this is data... Uh, obtained over a six month period uh, based, and so it's looking at mental health risk based on the depression, anxiety, and stress scores. I'm not sure if you use the DAS 21 uh, in Utah, but we use it quite a bit in Australia. And what it's looking at this data over from one employer is comparing data from November 22. Uh, the end of 22 through to six months later in mid-2023. And so the change, the two columns there, for example, if we look at the middle one, anxiety, so this is the population data which would go to the leaders and saying that people in the, the number of people in the normal anxiety range has significantly decreased. Uh, now, interestingly, if you look on the right at the stress column, there's been an increase in the number of people who are experiencing severe stress, uh, which wasn't what we hoped or expected. But you can then have the opportunity to say, well, why is this happening in this workforce over that six-month period? So, again, just to repeat, this is the group data uh, using a validated screening tool and looking at the impact of the interventions over the six-month period. Now, this is just one example from those nine uh, categories that I referred to earlier on. And again, the importance, I think, is presenting this in a, in a visual way that both the leaders and the workers can see the change and the impact of the intervention. And getting back to what we were saying about Ramazzini's challenge of how do you alter, effectively alter behaviours. What we're trying to do with this way of presenting the data is altering the behaviours of the individuals and also empowering the leaders and the business, the, the decision makers in the business to say that um, what we're doing is effective. The impact, we have to be able to measure the impact. Now, this is another example of cardiac risk factors. And uh, so, again, using validated health check screening tools, I do want to repeat, this is screening populations in the workforce. This is not uh, patients who have come to us with symptoms. This is uh, going out and, again, thinking back to Ramazzini, it's going into workplaces and looking for risk factors. Uh, a lot of occupational medicine, certainly in Australia, is reactive. And this is looking at population risk, uh, measuring blood pressure and doing uh, cardiac risk factors. If we think about, and I talk to the leaders um, and say, if you think about the, the trucks that you use in the mine, you would never consider not checking the blood pressure or the, the sorry, the oil pressure or the tire pressure or those sorts of things. Going out and assessing vehicles before they break down is normal practice. And perhaps it should be normal practice in our workforce. And again, this is looking at uh, interchange over time and that the number of people in the low risk category is in, has uh, increased and the number of people at the highest risk category has decreased. And again, this is something that has been well accepted by the leaders and the workforce uh, saying, okay, we, we can actually impact our risk over a period of time.
So they're just a couple of examples. And uh, certainly for us, they're the commonest areas of concern is cardiac risk and mental health. But there are similar sorts of models for looking at uh, culture and workplace, uh, specifically workplace culture and issues like bullying and harassment. Um, and with similar ways of presenting the data visually. Uh, also really important to get feedback, and this is one of the client companies. For those of you who are interested in, in marketing, uh, one of the, if you can only ask one question, if we look at the bottom of this page, the marketing and advertising people will say one of the most powerful questions is, would you recommend this product or this activity to your friends or your colleagues? And if you look at the last line on that page, would you recommend this program to your colleagues? And we were surprised that 96%, pleasantly surprised, that 96% of the participants said, yep, yeah, we recommend that our workers should participate in this program. And then, look, this is subjective, so you, we, can, we can discuss and debate the quality of, of, of this data, but it is important to, to get feedback. And uh, so the, the self-perceptions, if we go up to higher up in the table, the self-perception of quality of work, 58% of people said they thought the quality of their work was better. Feeling better in their selves over this period was 66%. 67% uh, thought that their health and well-being uh, was better. Uh, and so it is important to um, acknowledge that, that this, you know, this may not be accepted by the Cochrane collaboration, but uh, it, it's a starting point and it's um, essential, as I was saying earlier on, in, in communicating the value of occupational health to workers and workplaces um, in my experience, CEOs don't read information from the Cochrane Collaboration, but they will readily understand and accept this sort of, this way of presenting data, as long as we're academically honest and say that this is not perfect research, but we think it's valuable and we think it's important. And again, and other examples of presenting data to leaders. Uh, the, the information on the left, the $400,000 saving in leave costs over 12 months was information from one employer. And they said, this is, this is what we estimate we've saved um, since the program was instituted. The second column there, two lives saved from early intervention from uh, cardiac surgery. Again, is this the highest quality of data no, it isn't. However, in the workplace, well, the examples are, and the, the second one, three lives saved. This is this is anecdotal data where people have said, for example, the three lives saved. These were young workers saying after they had mental health screening on the DAS, they said, well, I had no idea how unwell I was. I didn't know that I had severe depression and anxiety. And um, two or three of them said that uh, seeing their DAS21 score made them realise that what they were experiencing wasn't normal. And those two or three said that they were actually, in retrospect, this was later, said that they were considering suicide uh, and that they were very grateful for the intervention from the psychologist. Again, it's not a double-blind case control study. But in workplaces, young workers saying that in the workforce that uh, it's very powerful. It, and and these, these, are real, these are real people. These are real people that Ramazzini and we go and talk to. Um, and the on the far right there, the total recorded injury frequency rate reduction in one company from 12.8 to 2.8 is something that the safety people and the CEO and the um, safety department immediately jumped out at them. So the reason for showing this data is to really ask the question, um, how do we present impacts? 
are we using the right language and the right imagery for the for our stakeholders, for the people that we're talking to? And should we only restrict ourselves to providing data that's from double-blind, placebo-controlled, longitudinal studies? Uh, I, I don't for a second diminish the value of those studies, but I, I think because we're working in workplace environments that we should open ourselves to thinking about how do we discuss the value of what we do in terms that are readily understandable to people who are responsible uh, and have power to change health and safety uh, in workplaces. So that's really, I think, as I say at the bottom there, for effective communication with organisations, we need to be learning a bit more about business language. Uh, I won't talk about this slide too much, but it's it's one way that um, again leaders like might like information presented, and this is isn't in a a journal article with an abstract at the top. Different people absorb information in different ways, and we need to be mindful of that. Uh, so look, this is just some data which you've uh, already seen, and it's gathering a, a little bit of in other um, information that I didn't have on the earlier slides. One of the organisations, their accounting department calculated that they estimated their return on investment of the program was about $54 per employee per month, which is an extraordinary return on investment. Uh, we've already discussed the TR, IFR reduction rate for one organisation uh, and the um, reductions in psychological safety. The reduction in psychology in depression and anxiety uh, was not as impressive as we'd hoped, but I think that's I think it's realistic. I think it's a realistic sort of result. Uh, employee engagement, I didn't talk about that much earlier, but this is really, as most of you will know, is a really important part of building culture at work and thinking about productivity um, and workplace culture. We could talk about this in a lot more detail. Uh, obviously, the uh, issue at the bottom, the physical safety in terms of uh, risk for sleep issues and cardiovascular risk is um, something that we think about, I think, more than workplace culture. So that might be another question for us. Uh, what's the potential role and value of occupational health in terms of talking to people in the C-suite about our potential for improving workplace culture? So I'm, I'm going to wrap it up by I, I, what I'm hoping to have uh, proposed to you and questioned for you is that there is an opportunity in occupational health for us to more effectively mitigate workplace risk factors by using technology through innovative software solutions and particularly to evaluate outcomes. Secondly, I'm questioning and arguing our um, capacity and our value of communicating what we do to workers, to employers and to policy makers and asking us to reflect on how do we do we use and do we know the, the language of CEOs or safety departments or policy makers? And I think that's a challenge for us to learn the language and to think about how we, uh, to carefully think about our messaging and our communication and being, as I said before, being honest academically that, um, that, that as I said, it's not double double blind uh, placebo controlled studies, but some of these, these um, results, and even if they're anecdotal, are incredibly valuable to individuals and to workplaces. Uh, and finally, I think if we consider leveraging, uh, gathering data from workplaces and leveraging it through software solutions and uh, effective communication strategies, I would argue that that then raises opportunities for increased employment of people working in the occupational health sphere and opportunities 
for training and education of our occupational health trainees, certainly in Australia. And I think that there's an opportunity in Australia for us to talk more to our uh, registrars and trainees about communication of value and the language of business. Uh, and then in closing, I would like to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Dr. Graham Wright, who owns uh, Optimum Health and Management Services in Western Australia. And I want to thank uh, Graham for sharing his knowledge and his data uh, with me and uh, allowing me to share it with you. So look, I'm going to uh, uh, stop now and I'll be delighted to be uh, challenged and uh, questioned on all, all, all that we've discussed. So uh, I'll wrap up there and open it for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter. I really appreciate that uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's, it's great to hear uh, real world uh, things. If people, uh, I, we've got a few enough people, I think Bubba's right, we could have anybody uh, pop in with a question. Uh, um, well, I will start. Um, so um, can you, Peter, can you tell, talk to us a little bit about what you do with the mental health uh, space? Uh, maybe starting with uh, the, I, I understand the screening issue, but what is done with the intervention side of it? Could you talk a little bit about to what extent there are any um, barriers, uh, people uh, unwilling to address it and or wanting to hide that topic still? Uh, any any thoughts on these issues? Uh, yeah, look, thanks for that question, Kurt. Um... It's yeah. The, the the answer is that uh, there's there's no single solution, uh, and certainly uh, in in the remote mining sphere where people are working away from home and working in harsh environments and working in um, for periods away from home and then flying home, there are very significant challenges there and uh, there's no quick solution and we've found that um, there, there are multiple pieces to the jigsaw uh, the and I'll just list perhaps some of those but one of the uh, those components include peer support so training of of workers to be, and I'm not sure if you do this in the US, but the peer support model, which um, certainly was has been used by emergency services in Australia for a long time, the fire services and police, where colleagues are trained in terms of identifying uh, altered behaviours in their friends and co-workers and being able to approach a co-worker and say, how are things going for you? I, I noticed that you know, you seem a bit different at work. So I think it's really important to, one of the components is the peer education and a peer support program. In Australia, that's been uh, abbreviated to Are You OK? Uh, are You OK Day? And, and that that's vital that colleagues are, are able to identify co-workers when their behaviour changes. The other, we did a piece of research a few years ago on the risks for remote workers and uh, as has been shown in other research one of the single uh, strongest predictors of stress and distress in the workplace is the relationship with the direct leader the direct line leader and that line leader's behavior towards the workers and so we actually shifted some of our focus from training on individuals about res resilience and coping with stress and coping with mental health issues for individual workers. We changed quite a lot of the focus to educating leaders and educating the leaders about how their behaviours can impact people working under them and really trying to improve the knowledge and skills and the behaviours of the leaders because that is such a predictor 
of stress in the workplace and psychological psycho the lack of psychological safety in workplaces. Uh, so I think it's it, it, uh, and then the other components are uh, the reactive component of having available telephone support through the employee assistance program and available availability of referral easy referral to clinical psychologists. What we were doing in this, the, 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 the cases that I showed to you is going to, the data I presented, is going to a workforce. And an example would be perhaps a workplace where a worker had committed suicide and then using the DAS21 questionnaire to screen the entire workforce or whoever volunteered. It was obviously it was voluntary. Uh, and then the resources there were both uh, online resources where people can go and th there's some fantastic online resources in terms of identifying self-identification of anxiety, stress, depression, with the opportunity to escalate to a clinical psychologist. And part of the program and part of the process were, was that people who flagged in the high risk categories, say for anxiety or depression, were then contacted by the program and saying, oh, can we have a chat to you? We're, thanks for completing the, uh, the questionnaires and we, we'd like to follow up with you. So um, it, it's, multi, it's a multiple approach. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Kurt, or whether um, there are other aspects you'd like to drill into there. Oh, that's that's uh, that's very helpful, uh, Bubba. Do you want to? Uh, have you read the 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 questions? Of course, are starting to come in left and right. So, uh, sure, Bubba. Do you did you get a chance to read some of them? The yes, I did. Yes, um, Peter. Uh, a question from Matt. I, I think maybe Matt Compton, although that could be wrong. Um, says uh, uh, I have a question around acute events. Do you have a sense of how much it costs an organization and lost time to those who are impacted either directly or indirectly? by the event, for example, a suicide? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I remember one of the one of the first talks that I gave um, some years ago to emergency services. I was giving a, a presentation to the emergency services team on workplace mental health and uh, they, and one of the, leaders of a team on one of the other sites it was unrelated or they were at a different mine committed suicide the night before I was giving the presentation on another mine and it was it was uh, very um, moving to see the impact on this whole team of emergency services uh, many of them didn't know the person and didn't uh, didn't know them personally but the impact uh, even hundreds of miles away was to see that on their faces the very next morning was uh, incredible. Can do I have do we have figures in terms of dollars and cents or time lost as a result of a suicide? Um, I don't have that. No, I, I'm afraid I don't have that. Um, I'm just I, I can take that question away and see. Um, if I can find numbers on that, I'm not sure if anyone else in the group would have that. Um, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? How do you measure that impact on friends and family and co-workers and production? Certainly um, in the mine sites that I deal with, they, if there's a suicide on a mine or if there's a suicide of a worker when they're at home, usually that mine will completely stop operations for at least a day or two, uh, minimum a day and sometimes two days. If the, if the suicide was on site, it will often be more than that. It can be two or three days until there's been an investigation on site. We would be able to get a dollar value for that. How much does it stop if you stop one mine operating for 24 hours? It would be... My guess would be it would be in the high tens of millions. Uh, but it's a great question, and I wish I had a better numerical answer for that. 
um, thank you. I'll, I'll take that away and reflect on it. Does anyone else in the group have a better answer than that? Not I. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see a question there. Okay, to reach out and continue the conversation. Certainly, yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy, Baba and Kurt, for my email address to be shared uh, with the group. It's uh, you'll have it. You'll have it, Baba, won't you? And I'm very happy for that to be shared. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe the next question we should uh, raise is uh, Melissa's. I think we can then go ultimately back to Eric's because he probably is asking also about cardiovascular disease, but Melissa's also on behavioral health there. She's about four, number four down. Uh, about, uh, are you also addressing substance use, including risky alcohol use? If so, uh, how so? And has it been cost effective? Yeah, another great question. Uh, certainly, uh, substance abuse in terms of drug usage and screening in the workplaces for drug use has been uh, a major um, undertaking not so much a, a not just part of the optimum health program but across Australia focus on particularly in remote mining communities there's been a major emphasis for many years on drug screening I, I, I think it's fair to say that the emphasis on alcohol use and alcohol the impact of alcohol is much much uh, the, the work uh, specific work in workplaces or focus, should I say, on alcohol abuse and the impacts of alcohol has not been as prominent. Uh, and I, I also think it's fair to say that alcohol, the, the culture in Australia certainly around alcohol, is a major problem. It's, it's a, a, an enormous problem. Um, some years ago when we... Uh, separate from the Optimum program, when we were doing some other health screening, a part of the health screening on one of the uh, one of the remote town sites included alcohol screening. It was interesting that the union representative representation in that town said that if, when we showed them the questions and the screening, they said that if the alcohol questions were included, that they would boycott the whole program that they wouldn't participate in any of the program at all. Um, and that was a reflection of the size of the alcohol problem because we had a screening regime and if people flagged at certain levels, then we escalated to liver function tests and it almost derailed the whole program. And we had to decide we were going to take those questions out and run with the rest of the program or take the alcohol questions out. And we, we took the alcohol questions out because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do anything. So I think that's a reflection of the, the size of the alcohol problem in Australia. I mean, it's much easier to talk about illicit drug use. Um, but look, that's, that's slowly changing. I think that's a, a generational change. And we have to be, in Australia at any case, we have to be really patient with that because people who are my age, you know, drinking and driving, was was almost normal. Um, you know, when I was learning to drive, there was no there was no alcohol testing, and uh, so I I can't underestimate the size of the problem, certainly in Australia, and it's something that we haven't um, that we're still on the pathway for, certainly for alcohol. Uh, one of the problems that I think is that people see that drug testing is the silver bullet. And drug testing, certainly, the, the experience in Western Australia is that drug testing for marijuana uh, has, has been decreased use, but methamphetamine use has skyrocketed because people in a fly-in, fly-out mining situation can take methamphetamine on their week off, stop it a day or two before they fly to site and not be detected. And so when people when people surface with methamphetamine problems on remote sites, they're often a long way down the path, a long way down the path. And um, so, yeah, we it's important, it's essential, but we don't have the silver bullet for alcohol yet, but we, it's something that we're uh, 
it's an increasing focus culturally, I think. It's cultural change. And when I see younger populations, I think they're a lot more sensible than my generation was. Great question. Thank you. Peter, we've got a, a follow-up to, to what you're talking about. Um, the wants to know, are these remote sites somewhat like a, quote, a man camp environment where the workforce is housed in dorms with control of the environment off work, like an offshore oil platform or something like that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. The, the sites are varied and some of them are completely what we call fly in, fly out. So no one lives there permanently, uh, but those sites could have up to uh 800 or a thousand workers one of the sites has over 2,000 workers so people would be there for one week or eight days and would fly off site and be at home for six days and yeah so on those locations the um their time off work there is gyms and a swimming pool and mess and recreational facilities on the sites but quite a number of the mines, the older mines, are in residential towns. So there are remote townships where families live and there's schools and police and you know, normal uh, remote country, well, not normal, but a, a remote country town in Western Australia. So, And there's a mixture of those. So some of the very remote mines are not based around towns. So there's a mixture, yeah. And that's one of the challenges, uh, getting linking those two questions. One of the challenges in, in our culture, at least, is providing activities and entertainment and challenge for workers which doesn't focus around alcohol. You know, they're not sitting at the bar on their time off. Um, and, and, and that's a cultural change over time, reducing the strength of alcohol, reducing the, the amount that people could have in any 24-hour period, and changing, providing other activities for people other than sitting around and drinking. Uh, Peter, maybe we could uh, do two more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one, let's do Kevin Connors. Uh, I'm curious about employer uh, recruitment. What kinds of employers and industries have been easier to get on board and which ones have been a more of a struggle? Can you talk a little bit about some of those dynamics? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'd say a couple of things. Most of the, I, I, I don't, uh, yeah, look, because we're very biased. I mean, in Western Australia, uh, a large part of the economy of the state is mining. It's iron ore, gold, diamonds, uh, and also oil and gas. Um, so that's, uh, people say to me, if you're in West, do you have anything to do with the mining industry? Everyone in West Australia has something to do with the mining industry or mining support services. So we've got a very biased um, work group population here. We don't, well, there's not a lot of manufacturing of, say, cars or aircraft or those sorts of things. So we're biased that way. Secondly, uh, un unfortunately, as is often the case in occupational medicine, people first come to you with their biggest problem. So they've had someone commit suicide on a site or they've had a long-term worker who everyone thought was fit and healthy have a cardiac arrest on site. Or uh, so um, that, that's off the case. People come to you with their biggest problem. And the challenge then is, is, is saying to them that this is more, uh, it's a broader issue and we can provide we can help you with that immediate challenge but um you need to you'll get most value by thinking a bit more broadly you know cardiac risk because they're interrelated the other challenge i suppose is and i think part of this discussion is the challenge for healthcare providers is um it, it doesn't um it's not accepted well as sort of selling ourselves. We're not, we're not good at selling ourselves. And, and I don't think we necessarily should be. Uh, I would always get suspicious and sceptical of uh, anyone who's got the silver bullet or the golden cure. So um, often the referrals are from 
other businesses. So a CEO of one organization says to one of his friends or colleagues, it's anecdotal, this is what we had, we used these people, uh, and this was our outcome. So um, a lot of it really is uh, that sort of communication between leaders in organisations who talk about anecdotes and say how or who helped solve their challenges. Um, so I, I hope that answers that question. And that, that's part of part of us learning that language of the language that CEOs or people in decision makers can use with their colleagues. Yeah. Their business. Yeah. That was just great. Uh, one other, one last thing is I knew you said there was emphasis on cardiovascular as well as uh, mental health and to make sure we've covered that. Can you just briefly mention what you do for the uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, on the uh, screen intervention side? Uh, yeah, look, that's that's standard sort of screening that you would be uh, familiar with is uh, looking at, think about the, the acknowledged risk factors, hypertension, uh, cholesterol, family history, cigarette smoking, uh, and so it's it's standard risk factors, exercise levels, obesity. Um, the challenge is grading that so that you're starting with self-reporting and then for people who flag at increased risk, then stepping that up to saying, well, you should be going to see your doctor and have perhaps have your lipids tested or have your blood pressure tested. Part of I think part of the challenge is trying to do get the most cost-effective approach. So how much can you pick up by questionnaires? And then can you flag a risk level which then escalates it? So the escalation process is important. We don't want to be doing large, expensive, and this is a challenge, large, complex medical health screening on the 60 or 70% of workers who are well. And that's, I think, the economic challenge is really doing the more significant screening for people who are at higher risk. Well, I, I thank you so much, uh, Peter. We are at uh, time and time goes by so fast. And I think you uh, did a marvelous job. Uh, and Kevin Connor noted, thank you. Very different than I expected. That's why we have to <laughs> ask <the> questions. <laughs> so again, thank you. And uh, from uh, Utah to Australia. Great. It's been a great pleasure, Kurt. And I, I look forward to hopefully visiting Utah one day. We'd love to have you and host you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks, Baba, for making it run so smoothly. Greatly appreciate it. Thank, Thank you all. You.